Hello. Okay, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm interviewing or having a conversation with Natalie on behalf of Edurne and Maria, who are two Spanish artists. Um, and so they've sent me some questions, so I'll be looking at my phone occasionally. Um, and yeah, this is, I'm Anna and this is Natalie Williams. Um, Hi. I'd, would you like to say a bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, I'm Natalie. I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham and I study something called gravitational waves where mm. I mostly look at black holes and what we call neutron stars and uh, how they smash together. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and as we look at the sky over the water at the moment, can you tell us what's happening between the Earth and the Sun at the moment? Yeah, of course. So right now, obviously, we're starting to see the sunset. So we're starting to see these colours and these rays coming through the clouds. And we get these colours because of the way that light gets here all the way from the sun. So in the day, we have a lovely blue sky. And then as it gets later, and even in the morning at sunrise as well, we have this red sky. And this is essentially because of how the sun is coming to us. It has to get to us through the atmosphere, the sun's light. And as it does that, the light scatters, scatters off all of these molecules in the atmosphere, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. They're all up there in the atmosphere and the light scatters, but not all light scatters the same. It depends on the color of the light. So in space, the sun is white and the space behind it is black. But when it comes through the atmosphere, it starts splitting up because the light, the more energetic it is, the bluer light, that end of the rainbow, scatters much more easily. So in the daytime, that blue light scatters and we have a lovely blue sky. But as the sun gets lower and lower to the horizon, it actually has to travel about 10 times the amount of space through our atmosphere. And so all of the blue light has scattered away and we're left with this lovely red light instead. We have a red sky here so that somewhere else, maybe America and Canada right now have a lovely blue sky and we get the leftover red light <laughs> that we're seeing right now. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, and how long does it take for the light to get from the sun to the earth? It takes 8 minutes and 22 seconds to get all the way here. So we say that the sun is 8 light minutes away. So it takes 8 minutes, but when we have a sunset, we're actually not just seeing the sun 8 minutes ago, we're seeing it an extra few minutes as well. Because the sun is so close to the horizon, it actually goes through something called refraction. Like if you've ever seen a straw in a glass of water and it kind of looks like it's bent a bit in the water when it actually isn't, we get that effect. So we actually see it a little bit later than it would have been because the light is bending around. So we've got the time difference and then we've also got this bending of light. So there's a few things going on. And I can see there's like, the light is like splitting through the clouds and it looks like it's coming in lines. Yeah, it's... Why does it do that? Beautiful. So we've got these rays of light and when we look at the stars, we call them point sources because we really just see that one ray. We can see it twinkling as it goes through our atmosphere, but the sun is a much bigger object and so we get much more light in these rays, these straight lines, and they hit the clouds so beautifully. A lot of people think that to see a good sunrise, you don't really want any clouds, you want to be really clear. But if you think about it, when we look at the sunrise, we look at how the light plays with the clouds. The clouds don't change the light so much, but they do reflect it. And it means that they show off the colors in a much more beautiful manner. So clouds are actually quite good, depending, as long as they're not rain clouds. And I guess, are we seeing the rays more clearly because they're coming at a flatter angle than they would normally, or? Yeah, so as they come through the atmosphere, we, um, we do see them much more pronounced here, right through the clouds. And yeah, that's, that's partly because it is going through, it's much, much thicker. It's kind of going at a diagonal, mm. unlike when the sun's straight overhead and it goes straight down. Instead, we have it going through this, this very sharp diagonal all the way through our atmosphere. It's really stunning. And when you watch the sunset and the sun goes from being round to being like squished, <laughs> like a flat little thing. Um, why, why does the shape change? Yeah, that is partly because of the refraction, the bending of the light. It bends different amounts depending on how close the horizon is. So closer to the horizon, the light is bent more, and further away it's bent less. And that's why we get that effect. Actually, in the morning, in the sunrise, you can actually see the sun slightly before it would actually 
be up if you if there was actually a straight line between you and the sun because it's bending around the the, the refraction is bending around the horizon a little bit so that's where we get this kind of shape okay so what happens between what happens between the sun and our eyes <laughs> so the sun is making all this energy it's burning hydrogen into helium and giving off lots and lots of radiation and it travels through the vacuum of space because light doesn't need any matter to travel it just travels straight through and it doesn't really hit much matter the space is very 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 empty there's some stuff there's earth and moons and planets and we do get particles from the sun in forms of like um particles that light up in our atmosphere that we call the aurora the the northern lights and the southern lights but it's mostly just empty space and it doesn't hit anything until it gets to our atmosphere and that's when it starts scattering scientists call that Rayleigh scattering and it'll scatter different amounts depending on the type of light it is if it's redder light or bluer light so it does this millions of times it goes through millions of particles scattering lots and lots each time before it actually starts coming through to us and it meets our eyes I prefer sunset because I'm not up early enough for the sunrise. <laughs> um, when we look at the sun in the daytime, it looks round. Um, is it round? Do, or if we, went, if, like, if we went to look at it, what would it look like? Yes, it is round. Um, the sun, scientifically, we say it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, which basically means it's round. That's, that's what it means. Um, and that's because the forces are balanced. It stays around. It doesn't contract and it doesn't expand. Not, not yet. Um, because it is in this equilibrium. It's this balanced forces. You've got the gravity wanting to pull it in, but then you've got all the gas molecules inside it that are trying to push it out. And they perfectly equal each other and balance and keep it in that round shape. So it is a very, very good sphere. Oh. We've got ten minutes until the sun officially goes down. Um, wh will this happen again tomorrow? See, that's actually a really good question. I think a lot of people think of things like, how do we know the sun will come up tomorrow? And it sounds like a silly question, but that's, it's really important as scientists that we ask these questions. Um, and the, question, the answer to that really is, it depends on what you, you mean by how do we know it will. In a scientific way, we, we know it will because it essentially always has. <laughs> um, there was actually a scientist called Laplace, he was a mathematician, and he asked this very, very question um, a very long time ago. Um, what's, what's the chance? How do we know the sun will come up tomorrow? And he ran some statistics, and you need some, some knowledge. So he said that if the sun has risen for 10,000 days in the past, which I think is probably an underestimate, um, what's the chance of it, of it rising tomorrow? And uh, he ran the maths, and I think he got 99.9900002. So that's the chance of it rising tomorrow. <laughs> and that tiny percentage on the end, what, what could cause it not to? Well, you've got to put all these different pieces of evidence together. So that's just statistics, that's just maths. We also have other knowledge, because we look at all of the other stars out there. You know, all of the... We think there's a um, hundred billion stars in each galaxy alone. And we think there's a trillion galaxies, so a hundred billion trillion stars that we can see out there. And so we know quite a lot about stars by looking at them. So we can figure out how old these stars are, how long they live for, what's the chance of one of them just dying tomorrow. And by putting all of that knowledge together, we can infer things about our own sun that make us pretty sure that it, it won't. But if, if it did, <laughs> if, if something were to happen, first of all, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes and 22 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Um, because not only do we have this, the light, that's seeing the sun at the speed of light, but also gravity travels at the speed of light as well. So we'd be fine for, for eight minutes and 22 <laughs> seconds. Um, and then, then we would have some problems. <laughs> <laughs> what would the problems be? Um, so... If the sun didn't stop there, it didn't, went away, we didn't have a gravitational field, essentially we would just fly off into space. We'd just we'd fly off, we'd go off in some direction. Um, but 
as I say, the chances of that are pretty low. You know, how do we know if we throw up a ball in the air that it'll actually come back down? Well, we've run the test 10,000 times and uh, it comes back down every other time. And so we say it's a pretty good chance that it, that it will. But if it didn't, then we would have to change our minds. You know, as a scientist, you've got to be open to you might not be right. You know, one of your predictions might be wrong. You can measure it millions of times. And then if there's a problem, you have to be open to that and uh, change your worldview. And when you say a star, a star dying, so you talk about we look at other stars dying, um, what does that mean? And what would it mean if it happened to the sun? So it depends on what stars you're looking at. Stars die in different ways. Um, our sun is about halfway through its life on what we call the main sequence, which is what it's doing right now. It's burning hydrogen into helium. And um, in a very long time, uh, it'll, it'll run out of hydrogen pretty much. Um, and it'll expand. It'll expand to roughly about where the Earth is. So it'll engulf we're not totally sure if the air's going to get engulfed, but it'll be close enough that it won't be a great time. Um, <laughs> and so after that, it'll become a red giant and it'll start burning the helium. Um, and then at some point, nothing extremely dramatic is going to happen to our sun. It's just kind of going to let go of its outer layers. It's just going to slowly let go and there'll just be this, this star that we call a white dwarf left in the center. And it, it won't be fusing anything, it won't be burning anything, it'll still be very hot for a very long time, it'll slowly cool down, but th that's what will happen to our sun. But that's not the case for all stars. It, stars that are bigger go through something called a supernova. Um, and a supernova is essentially a massive explosion. You know, they burn elements all the way through the periodic table up to iron, and then they can't, they can't go past iron as a, as a barrier there, it's not allowed. So then it explodes. And after it explodes, it scatters in this explosion all the elements that it's created, all the planets, and they can create more things. You get more stars and, you know, the elements here on Earth were most likely created from a supernova. And in the center, you're, you're left with two options. You're left with either, if it's pretty heavy, but, but not extremely heavy, you're left with a neutron star, which is a very, very dense object. If, if, if our planet Earth was a neutron star, um, it has a mass of the Earth, be about the size of a penny. So if our sun turned into a neutron star, it would probably be slightly smaller than Birmingham. <laughs> so that's, um, that's kind of scale we're talking. Or option two, if it's even bigger than that, it starts, keeps collapsing. It collapses into a single point, at infinite density, and we call that a black hole. And uh, they suck things in and uh, once you go past the event horizon, there's, there's no return. So luckily, neither of those things are going to happen to us and it's, it's not quite big enough. It is going to be quite a slowly letting go of the layers, but that's essentially what happens to stars. And then the whole thing starts over again. What's the difference between sunrise and sunset? So, I mean, it's essentially just the turning of the earth. So on one side, you go from the night into the day and you've got the sun on one side of the earth and it, it starts to rise for us. Um, and like I say, somewhere else we'll have the blue light that they're seeing and then other places are in darkness. And then we get the very edge, the very, very red light, essentially a circle all the way around that gets that red light. And then we have the day as the sun goes over. It doesn't, doesn't really go over straight ahead. It goes along a line that we call the ecliptic. So it stays quite close to south and it will be lower or higher depending what season you're in, what time of the year it is. And then right now, at the end of the day, you're getting a sunset. And it's the same thing as a refraction then, but just, yeah. just the opposite time. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just the other way around essentially. How old is, is the sun at the moment? Gosh, how old is the sun? <laughs> I could not put a number to it straight out of my head. I would have to look it up. Its it's about halfway through. Got, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've got to worry about it. <laughs> we've got we've got a fairly fairly long time, but yeah, I don't know the number off the top of my head as to how old it is. If anyone does, feel free to feel free to say. It. I'd have to Google that. Can I ask a stupid question then? What's a red dwarf? A red dwarf. A red dwarf 
is, from my knowledge, essentially a, a white dwarf that's a lot cooler. As, as it cools, uh, it gets redder. Um, colder objects are redder. By looking at stars and by looking at the colour they are, we can tell what temperature they are. That's how we, we measure temperature, just by looking at colour, essentially. So the sunset is happening now, <laughs> in the next three minutes. So, um, And loads has changed since we got here, because we had that phase with all the big rays. Mm -hmm. And now we've just got this tiny line of sun in the clouds, and then this pink over here. Um, but we've put this pinpoint time on it that, I mean, the weather app says it's at quarter past nine. What is that event? that specific event and what will change in that minute so that is essentially just the actual ball of the sun the last bit of it as it just slips slightly below the horizon or as we see it slightly slip over the horizon as i say there's a lot of there's a lot of tricks happening a lot of light working that that makes it a bit dubious where the sun actually is isn't where we see it as it is but we have to measure things as we see them because that's how it affects our life and the animals and everything around us is how we perceive it so that's where we have to measure these things from take a little i'll take a little pause there to to just notice that happening so the redder it gets it means it's more refracted it's further the, the sunlight is further away so it needs it's more it's bending basically. so the redder it is the more blue light has been scattered away yeah yeah so the redder it is the more of the atmosphere it's had to travel through mm, okay. how would it summarize it like if you start off with like it just being a little bit red and just, then it gets I was just thinking about I'm just wondering whether there's a correlation, there might be, not be, there may not be, but uh, you know with um, maybe a lot of the climate change and stuff that's going on in the rest of the moment, do you think that will have a direct effect on the way the sun and the sunlight is perceived? In mm. Will climate change have an effect on how we perceive the sunlight? Um, yes, I think it will change, especially the sunset. There's a lot of factors that, that go into the sunset. There's um, the clouds. Like I said before, it's quite nice to have clouds that are quite high in the atmosphere, like these ones here are very high, and that's why we're getting such lovely refraction. Um, but there's other things as well. There's clean air. So the cleaner the air is, the more vivid the sunlight will be, um, which is why you get some amazing sunlight in places like the tropics, places where it rains a lot, really cleans the air. Um, so pollution really isn't good if you want to see a spectacular sunrise or sunset. So, and also the humidity. So humidity changes how we perceive the sunlight as well. So the lower the humidity, the more vivid it's gonna be. So in the winter time, it's much more vivid because it's such um, a less humidity. So I would think that as humidity changes and pollution changes with climate change, it will change how we affect the sea, sunrise and sunset. That's a really interesting question. I was just thinking because I saw Polo's online about the conversation when you were speaking about since three and I was like, sorry, but that's a silly question. No, it's a great mm, question. Actually, maybe it's this there like a connection here between the climate change and being action by the agency, I think. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm seeing like purple now, I think. Is that just me or? It does slightly look a bit more purpley. Is that the blue mixed with, with the red or? I think that that is our perception of the clouds. It is the clouds that you're seeing that look a bit more purpley. Yeah. I think that's more of a, I think that's a, the contrast that we're seeing. You know, when the red next to the white, it does make it look more purpley because of that. I think the, the clouds, the clouds basically make a canvas that we can see the light on, that it reflects down. And we see the light, but we also see the absence of light. And where, I mean, it's not really white, is it, the clouds at this point? They're kind of darkening. And I think that's why we get that kind of purpley tone. Yeah, so in, in the day, if we were looking at these clouds, they would look white? Yeah, they look much more, much more white, but now we're, we're getting these kind of darker reflections as the sun starts to set and so we get these colours and, and they start to darken.
And does this line of light along the clouds mean that we haven't quite passed the, the tipping point? It's difficult to say because even though we've still got some light there, um, we have a difference between sunset and twilight. There's still some light that can get over, but the actual sun itself, the, the boundary of the sun, might have gone below the horizon. It's difficult to tell because we've got the clouds in the way at the minute. So Ah, so twilight, is that when the sun has... We can't see the sun, it's past the horizon, but we're still getting light from the we sun. We still get some sun. light kind of surrounding it. And so twilight is later when it's much, much darker. There are lots of places in the UK that the sun doesn't it doesn't actually fully set in that sense we don't get twilight up in the north of scotland they have something called the simmer dim um, which is when you you never get a fully dark sky and that would be now actually that'll be in the summer Yeah, you'd have to go really fast, but yeah. How fast would you have to go to catch the sunrise? Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, could could you could you stay in a in a day? Yeah, you'd keep... follow the Earth round. Yeah, you'd have to go a full 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd have to do the maths. Super quickly. <laughs> what, what the diameter of the Earth is twelve thousand kilometers, and then you've got twenty-four hours. So. Um, you know that because. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then you divide them, and that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> three hundred. So. Keep going and catch up. You know what? I would have to sit down with a piece of pen and paper, and I will tonight. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say for sure without seeing any numbers. <laughs> That's a really good question, though. I hadn't thought about that. Really good, Brad Pitt. Pitt. Well, it wasn't after the answer, it was the observation that you could go back and you could chase it. Yeah, you could definitely. You could. Yeah. Go back to the sun again. Yeah, you have to. But one of the rumours, wasn't it, Brad Pitt and co, they, they, they did um, New Year's Eve in Australia and then sort of got over to somewhere where I was to have it again. <laughs> it's sort of, they had the longest New Year's Eve party anyway. <laughs> okay, so it is humanly possible. Yeah, whether it's true if or you're not, Brad I don't Pitt. know. If you're Brad Pitt. If you're Brad Pitt. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, that, is that doable? Sort of? I or suppose it's time zone, isn't it? It's in that book. He just lived on a very small asteroid and he just moved his chair down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the International Space Station, they go around the planet once every 90 minutes. So they get 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every single day up there. Holy wow. shit. What wow. does that do to their biorhythms? Um, they, they have alarm clocks and so <laughs> they do sleep a regular human day. They actually sleep on Moscow time. Um, because that's where they communicate with a lot of the time. Um, so they are on regular days, but yeah, they're, they're not tuned to the sunlight anymore. <laughs> What's Can that I, green oh, thing that yeah. happens on the horizon when the sun goes down the green flash? The green flash? It's meant to be a green flash just as the sun goes down. Well, I've not heard of a green flash. Oh, oh, so maybe it's to do with the reflection of the, 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 yeah. the water. It's meant to be like a momentary green flash. So yeah. Well, if you've got the if you've got <laughs> if you've got the red light of the sun and then you've got the blue light of the water, that could be some kind of effect between between a reflection right on the sea line. No, I've not heard of that, but that totally makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> fantastic. Can I ask why um, at sunset the clouds seem to like spread in this way that's like a different perspective than you normally get in the daytime? Yeah, I think that that is, it, I, think, I don't think the clouds spread, but they do appear to spread because this is where all of our sunlight is concentrated now. And so it kind of gives the illusion that there are more clouds along the horizon because they're the ones that, uh, that have this residue light behind them. And so they're much more prominent to us.
and obviously like I say we're looking across much more of the atmosphere so even though the clouds might not be there might be not be more of them they look like there's more of them because we're looking at quite a larger distance and then we can also have that effect on them being lit up And how quickly will it get dark now that the sun's gone? Now that the sun's gone, I reckon it'll be quite dark. Maybe, maybe by eleven, I would say it would get it would get reasonably dark. I don't know the time off off the top of my head, but um, I would say around about eleven. That's when I would come out if I was going to come stargazing, for example. I was hoping to be able to see a planet right now, but the clouds are in the way. Which planet? So Venus should be just where that cloud is there um, <laughs> just above the sun and to the left yeah. uh, and the moon should be as well but I think both of them are, are covered by clouds but if you do want to see any planets tonight Jupiter and Saturn will be up in the south um, they'll rise about 10 maybe so there's still hope <laughs> and the stars are all out but we just can't see them we just can't the see them yet we need to wait for it to get a bit darker and then we'd be able to see a few stars. And it's a fantastic night stargazing. It's so clear. Um, even in the cities, you can see a good amount of stars. You'd be surprised, but if you, if you, if you acclimate yourself and you, you look at the dark for long enough, you can see quite a number of stars, a fair few constellations, um, which hopefully I think you would be able to see tonight after, after it got a bit darker. I think right now you'd only be able to see Venus if it weren't for the clouds because apart from the sun, Venus is the, the brightest object, and obviously the moon um, in the sky. But obviously not right now. But there will be some really bright stars up overhead in the next few hours. So if you, if you look up, you should be able to see some. <laughs> and I'm starting to feel a bit colder now. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, so um, obviously the sun brings through heat as well in its radiation so it brings heat through our atmosphere and our atmosphere traps it in that's why it kind of gets hotter throughout the day even though the sun's right overhead at 12 it kind of gets hotter kind of more in the late afternoon but now that the sun's setting we're not getting that straight on radiation uh, it's starting to cool down and we'll have to get our jumpers out i think <laughs> yeah as soon as as soon as you get less light on your skin it feels much cooler. on holiday we'd be driving down to Cornwall and I always notice because we have to get a ferry so we go very in the middle of the night but it's just an observation and I always see the sun comes up so you're driving along and I always see the sun when I look in the mirror it's pitch black that's like quite, quite a weird sensation and then like if you split it you look one way and it's really dark and you look the other way and the sun's up so I suppose why doesn't it go, I suppose that must be the angles again, is it the reflections, why doesn't it just, like when you turn on the light bulb, it's light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when the sun comes up, why isn't it just light? It's like one side dark, one side yeah. light. Yeah, why is that? Yeah, like you say, it's, it's, it's mostly because of the angles, that, that that side of the sky just hasn't got any at all, and then as it starts to rise, you've got that stark difference yeah. between, you know, really dark blackness on one side, and then the sun starting to rise on the other. And yeah, it's essentially these, these very shallow angles 
that it starts to come through. Bro, I'm trying to talk to her and she's so Yeah, but guess what? I'm your girl. Anyone else? Do you get some Yes, you do. You do. But um, it's very different because of different atmospheres. So on other planets, you do get sunrise and sunset. But usually that just means that the sun is literally up just the ball that is the sun. You don't get these colours because most of these planets don't have much of an atmosphere. Um, places like Mars doesn't really have much of an atmosphere um, it does mean that you see less stars close to it a lot of a lot of pictures like on the moon landings you don't see stars and people start saying that wasn't the moon it was a studio because there are no stars <laughs> and that's just an effect of the light that's the effect of the lighting but you don't get as a, a spectacular views on a lot of other planets without a severe atmosphere I guess on 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 Venus where you've got much heavier clouds and atmosphere you would but a lot of the time in, in the planets in our solar system it's either no atmosphere or too much atmosphere. So you have the atmosphere that creates the refraction that's got signal to kind of Yeah, to break. scatter off. Yeah, then other planets is just sun up yeah, down. It just comes straight down, yeah. Like on Venus it's uh it's got such a thick atmosphere that everything is orange all the time. So you get less of the playful colours. It's just, yeah, orange and dark, essentially. And then on places like Mars, there's very, very little atmosphere. So you just kind of get the sun just there. On Earth, from a static position over a 24-hour period, we go from sunrise to through sunset to sunrise again. On a static position on the Moon, at the same period of time, what would you experience or see? On the Moon... Yeah, so on the moon, you would essentially get the same thing, but the difference is, is where we see the moon, you would see the Earth. So you'd have that as well. Sorry, I've <laughs> got my hand in the way. <laughs> and if we had evolved differently and our atmosphere was predominantly another gas, like methane or mm -hmm. some other thing, could we have other colours, other boundaries to those colours? Um, I think that the colours, provided that the atmosphere wasn't so thick, if it was like of a similar density that the sunlight was allowed through in the same way, um, I'm not sure it would change it that much because the reason that they scatter blue light better is because these particles are much, much smaller than what we say the wavelength of the light is um, by quite a few orders of magnitude. So you'd have to have particles that were really, really quite big to start scattering different colours in different ways but that's if they were the same amounts of particles like on planets like Venus where you've got much denser atmospheres that's a different story because you've got such such thicker thicker ones so there's more fractions of dis diffusion going on it's yeah thicker. yeah you've got much much more interactions of these particles as the light's coming through yeah exactly oh, look what's that there no one's got a pair of scissors out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cutting it's it out. It's a glitch, it's a glitch. <laughs> yeah. So where would be the best place on Earth to stargaze in? So presumably if you're in the Antarctic where there's nothing around for miles and it's white yeah. and all of that. that it totally depends on what you want to see because different places on Earth you can see different parts of the sky. So if you were stargazing... I do a lot of stargazing in Scotland. Um, you see a lot of the Northern Hemisphere sky. So you see a lot of constellations that are to do with Greek and Romans and myths. Um, but if you wanted to go to the Southern Hemisphere, if you went to New Zealand, you would see the Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way. So mm. it depends if you want to see more the galaxy or more the stars. In places in the Southern Hemisphere, a lot of the time we, we kind of join stars together mm -hmm. and have made shapes throughout history um, but in a lot of places in the southern hemisphere they have such an amazing view of the Milky Way that they actually made shapes out of the Milky Way the dark bits and the lighter bits mm -hmm. and they make these amazing shapes they have something called the great emu in the sky <laughs> in New Zealand because <laughs> the Milky Way looks like it has a really big emu in <laughs>
Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it looks really odd. A completely, completely different sky. Yeah, a, a lot of people that, you know, Aboriginal people there, they, they, they use the um, Milky Way, but they also had their own shapes. But the constellations that we're familiar with um, were actually decided by what we call the International Astronomical Union. And the, the, the ones in the Southern Hemisphere that we recognize now are from travelers that sailed down. And so they've, re they've, re they've remade their own constellations that we recognize. And um, I personally think they're all a bit boring. <laughs> in the Northern Hemisphere, we've got all these amazing creatures. We've got, you know, um, Sagittarius, and we've got Orion, and all these stories. And in the Southern Hemisphere, you've got the oven. <laughs> the set square, the triangle. You've got all of these people. People looked around at what they had on their boats, and they said, "That." <laughs> are star signs real? They're real in the sense that they they are constellations up in the sky. Um, they're on what we call the ecliptic. So the sun. The sun travels along an imaginary line that we call the ecliptic if you tracked it throughout the year, and so do all the planets. You'll never see the planets from Birmingham, at least, right up above you, straight up. They, they won't be there. They travel along the same line as the sun, which is for us, because we're quite high up in the Northern Hemisphere, usually quite lower in the sky. Um, and all the way around, though all those constellations, those are the star signs, and your star sign is where the sun was when, when you were born and you can usually see them. A lot of them are really good for stargazing and at some point in the year yours will always be up. But are they real in the sense of should you look into them? I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what to believe. <laughs> um, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you mentioned a really interesting point about astrology and it's my understanding that the astrology is something in that culture that apparently like in Egyptian times they used to um, study I'm not sure about the history of that. I, I feel like tomorrow morning there's going to be a lot of discussion to do with the history um, with Mark, so I think he's probably the one to talk to about that. Um, so maybe save that one for, for tomorrow, but it's, it's very No spoilers, very interesting we don't know point. what's going to happen. <laughs> So it's now getting to the point where I'm like finding it harder to distinguish what I'm seeing. Like before I could see loads of different kinds of green in the trees and now it's sort of starting to look like one silhouette. Why is that? We've just got so much less light. We've got the, and we've got the stark comparison between that lingering light behind it, but we've got no light coming from the other direction, all the way over there, um, right. in the opposite direction. Yeah, because I can see all kinds of colours when I look this way. Yeah, and but, it's because we've not yeah. got that stark comparison between the light here and no light lighting up the trees anymore and that darkness and it'll only get darker and darker until the stars come up first went by it was a very thin line and now it's a big fat white line that's pinky well, you know. on there yeah mm. so what what happened to make it start off looking thin yeah yeah so when it was coming out originally um you know it had just just been made and then you've got the turbulent atmosphere which is moving and the particles moving about and they spread out and they will go off in different directions and it'll get, it'll get larger and larger until we can't see it anymore um, as that time goes by. But right now it's, it's really nice, it's very white and it means it's reflecting the colours really well. Yeah, it's making like swirly shapes. Is that the shape of the turbulence? Yeah, so that's just the, the shape of our atmosphere. So, so um, is that turbulent used atmosphere. In, in weather, study of weather then? Like um, to see what's happening up there, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I guess if you definitely looked up there, you could kind of. I mean, you, you can. 
it depends where in the atmosphere as well because I mean that, that that plane will be quite high in the atmosphere so depending on how high it would be and where the turbulent parts were you could definitely get a sense of what's going on and how comes it didn't continue is it just, just mm. the height of the plane change changes the angle that we're at that's interesting yeah why don't you see yeah why it's not there anymore yeah I think that that's something to do with the plane itself I don't know whether the height has changed so much or whether it's Yeah, yeah. Hurry up! <laughs> We're trying to chase them. No, they're moving away from the sun. <laughs> How far back into our history would you have to go to see different sorts of sunsets, sunsets and sunrises, and what would those major differences be? Like talk millions of years and things like that. different kinds would the sun of sunsets have been much bigger, and sunrises. Or would the have been different colours? Mm. Um. Would the frequency have been any different? I suppose as the atmosphere changes, these things do change. I mean, we've had extinctions in humanity as well, where, you know, like volcanic ash has gone up and completely blocked the sun and life has died. So at those points, it definitely would have been very different. Um, we'd have had the sun blocked completely. I think you'd have to go quite a long way back to notice any significant changes. But I think you definitely would as the atmosphere of the Earth has changed over time, depending on evolutionary paths and what's happened to it. <laughs> um, what I'm noticing now is that all the blue is over there and all the pink is down the bottom there and there's like some yellow in between mm -hmm. um, could you talk a bit about that yeah so we've as if you can see it's it's, it's more blue there but then yeah. it kind of gets much darker and darker over there yeah and um, we've got more light at the horizon and that's because of this kind of like scattering in the refraction of the Sun along the edges but as we'll see, that is going to get darker and darker and darker as the stars start to come out. But yes, yeah. And is this sort of yellowish, is actually just a very pale blue? Or? Yeah, it's kind of this, uh, this transition between the thinner parts of the atmosphere that we can see going to the thicker parts of the atmosphere. Yeah. Does the sun move? Yes, the sun does move. So. Um, we uh, live in a galaxy called the Milky Way, um, and we have a supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy called Sagittarius A star. And um, the sun does travel around that. I think the sun has been around 18 times um, since the birth of it, essentially. So uh, the sun is 18 galaxy years old. So just, just old enough for a drink. Um, <laughs> So, and did we go yes. with it round the... So the Earth will have gone round with it. The Earth has changed a lot over the course of history um, and evolutionary. The Earth was made because when the, when the sun was being made, it, it created this disk around it. And this disk had a lot of matter in it. And that's what the planets are made out of, including the Earth. And at one point, the Earth was much smaller. Um, I think it was called Gaia um, and there was a, an object about the size of Mars that, that crashed into it and then it formed the earth that we know today and the part that went off because some of in, in that impact some of it went off and, and formed the moon so a lot of happened in those 18 years but essentially the earth has gone along with it it's changed a bit over, over, over the time <laughs> And has that object left any any parts of it in the Earth that we have today? So the reason we think that that's what happened is because when we've been to the moon and brought things back, we, we've noticed a lot of similarities. We've noticed that these were once part of the same objects. So that's why, that's why we know, because it left parts and we left parts on it, essentially. 
That's that's why we think that. And um, what's giving me the illusion that I can see like sort of lines of light above the horizon? Is it clouds? I think that or? is the clouds. I think it's like like we They're were very talking. Very thin. Yeah, because the clouds, it's different types of clouds of at different points higher up in the atmosphere and those lines look like they're getting closer together as you look towards the horizon because you're looking through more of the clouds and so mm. it looks like they're more condensed and giving that kind of like line effect and then you've got like speckles of pink yeah sorry really pretty i mean these are the clouds that you want for a sunset you want you want ones like that where they're quite high up and, and kind of bitty you don't you don't want really thick ones close to the, well, <laughs> ones, <laughs> ones like those usually um but i mean you, they're still beautiful in their own way because you get the them lit up from behind mm. but for really really spectacular sunsets these kind of like clouds that almost aren't clouds kind of fluff in the sky mm. That's what you want, so that all the sunlight gets reflected back down. If we're, if we're going around the sun, are there other planets? I suppose if it's along to rock in space, but are there other planets that have more than one sun? So if you were if you stood up, you'd have a sun over there and another one over there, and do different things. Yeah, there are things that go around. In fact, most of the stars that you look up and see in the sky aren't single stars, they're double star systems. If not more, we think there are more double star systems than there are just individual stars. And so some of those do have planets as well. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah, some, some planets have even, some planets have two suns. I think an interesting fact about that is that it was first theorized in Star Wars, <laughs> isn't it? Is it? Is it Tatooine? Does anyone know Star Wars? I, I don't know it very well, but it's, 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 I think it's Tatooine that has two suns. And uh, when that came out, everybody said, that's ridiculous, that's ridiculous. John, Lu John Lucas has come up with something insane. And then, uh, I think it was a decade later, they found one for real. And so he predicted it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Just be exhausted if you've never got dark. Yeah, well, it would be tiring. It's rough, honey. You have to get lights and the bits have never got dark as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had that, don't we? I mean, in Shackleton and stuff, wasn't it? When the polar explorers. Yeah. The sun, sun goes down isn't it, on Tuesday and it's gone for six months or whatever. Isn't it? And that'll be back six months' time, yeah. So again, turning of the Earth, isn't it? That's to do with that. It just, just must be a bad one. Yeah, that's because of, of the angle. So we, we, we go around at a slight angle around the sun and that means that at some parts in the year we're tilted towards the sun and so the sun appears higher in the sky and our days are longer, we get our summer and then at other points in the year we're tilted away from the sun and that's when we get our winter and if you're at the really extremes that's when you'll get 24 hour daylight or 24 hour night because of that Sorry? If you're at the tropics, you need to crack on if you want to see the sun <laughs> Straight down. Really fast. What makes yeah. some places have fast sunrise and sunsets and some places have slow ones? Yeah, why yeah. is why is that? Yeah, I'm trying to think. That's where I've, I've not been anywhere to the tropics before. Yeah, I've been to Yeah, so where we are, because we're quite quite high up, the sun variation throughout the year is is quite dramatic. It gets quite high in the summer, but it, it gets really low even at midday in the winter. The sun mm. is so low, whereas in the tropics it's quite constantly quite high and so rather than the very the slope that we have theirs will go straight go down straight and you'd have less of those dramatic angles so yeah yeah that would be the case it's it's really interesting looking at the sky from different places in the world because obviously if you're at the equator the moon is like sideways isn't it it's 
like on its side. Yes. And instead of getting a crescent moon like a banana, it's like like a smiley face. Or, <laughs> yeah. Why why is that? That's just because of where you're viewing it from. If you went to Australia, the moon would be upside down. But on the tropics, because of where you're viewing it, well, on the on the on the equator, because we are viewing viewing it from, you're viewing it straight side on to how we would view it at 90 degrees. And so yeah, it looks like a looks like a little smiley face. <laughs> I've never seen it, but I would really like to. I've seen that, but I didn't know why. I <laughs> thought I was imagining it. No. <laughs> I was just um, wondering, you know, in terms of natural disasters such as earthquakes and stuff, and especially when they start to like disintegrate into the air, does that have a relationship on the sun or the stars or how? Because like there was, I'm not quite sure if you've heard of recent one there was that really big earthquake in the Caribbean and they had to be back to where it was recently like and it was still showing the earthquake days of the days would that still have a would that have a relation from when the sun would come out with the heat of the sun or especially as it evaporates and clears and stuff. Mm. Yeah well I think I mean I think it would depend on the severity of the earthquake wouldn't it? Like we were talking about pollution and 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 things like that. So I think that would have definitely. I think that would have an effect, possibly, on how you would perceive the sun. But I don't. I don't think it would have any lasting damage. But that's that's a good question. Yeah. I've never taken pictures from the start of a sunset to the end of a sunset before. It's quite interesting the relationship between the amount of light and the intensity of colour. Mm. Because you'd mm. think it would be it's kind of almost the opposite. Like as the light goes down, the intensity of the light brightens. The colours the colours become more intense. It's really weird. Yeah, it's the contrast that you yeah. get. Yeah. I don't really think about it. Yeah. The reflection in the water is beautiful as well. Mm. You get that thing with photography like the golden hour as well. Like yeah. I mean, like mm. this, like this well, I felt like when you were walking over the bridge, that was like the golden hour, it was really all hitting you, kind of key light. But it was like, you'd say the golden hour, so it's one time, but over this half an hour there's been like really different mm. colour changes and different kind of effects almost, mm. like I'm sure you could do Photoshop or whatever, but um, you know, there's, different, there's different golden hours. Kind of mm. thing, like, yeah. I wonder what a long exposure shot of the sunset would look like, I've not seen one leaving the camera on and seeing how oh, it would change. Wow, yeah. I wonder how that would be. Yeah, you see that with space, don't you? And, and you see the stars moving across the sky, but... Yeah. Yeah. You've got to be quick with astrophotography, because even a few minutes and mm. the, the trails start. If you've ever yeah. used a telescope to look at the planets, you can look at the planets, but you have to be quick, because mm. they'll move so fast they'll be out of yeah. shot. Because they have like the, the set it at this specific. I don't, I don't know anything about it, but I know that you have to like set it at a specific angle and like. It's yeah, you can get fancy like mounts called I think they're called German um, equatorial mounts, and they move at the same rate as the stars. Mm -hmm. And so you get those beautiful. I mean, they're very expensive, though. <laughs> but they perfectly move at the same rate that the stars move through the sky, and so you get those still images. If, you, if you've got the money to spend. <laughs> what's the shooting star? I don't really know much about shooting stars, but what's their backstory? Yeah, <laughs> shooting stars are a bit of a misnomer because they're, they're not really stars. Um, they are bits of rock coming through the atmosphere. Have you, have you heard of meteors, meteorites? Um, so a shooting star is a meteor, and a meteor is that flash of light you see in the sky. Right. And that's matter, that's, that's matter burning up in our atmosphere 
and you get meteor showers when we pass through where comets have been. So comets go around the sun and they leave this wake of particles mm. and if the earth passes through the wake, just like the wake of that aeroplane, mm. they leave wakes oh, just like that. Okay, yeah. yeah. And it's like turbulence around it. It's just a well, in space there is no turbulence. Mm. It's a vacuum, so it just kind of stays there. Um, and then our earth passes through it and smashes into our atmosphere and, and they burn up and right, that's when okay. we get yeah. a shooting so it's, star. It's landing into our atmosphere, that's why we get a shooting star. And usually they never make it to the ground and they're nothing to worry about. But if they do get to the ground, that's Very when you cool. call it a meteorite. So a meteorite is the rock left over mm. and the meteor is the, the flash of light that you would see. Mm. And so it would have been like burnt up in the... Usually they get burnt up because usually these, these particles are the size of grains of sand. Mm. Um, sometimes you get bigger ones, golf ball size ones, we call those fireballs because they're so bright. You can sometimes see them in the day, that's how bright they are, but they're much, much rarer. And yeah, if you get something left over, you call it a meteorite. But if you ever see a meteorite, you should not touch it under any circumstances. And you might think that's because it would be too hot because it's just been burning up. But it's the complete opposite. It's because it's so cold that if you touched it, your skin would fuse to it. Okay. How can you tell if you're lifting on the ground whether it's a meteorite? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's just fallen from the sky. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just been in the vacuum of space. So yeah. it's very cold. Don't yeah. touch it. Give it a while to cool down. And then take well, it not cool down. To warm up. Warm up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if we see what we call shooting stars, um, something that's visible to the naked eye, how big would they be? You talked about grains of sand. I mean, how big would they be for us to see them? You can see them if they're the size of a grain of sand. Okay. They, they do burn extremely. As, as long as, mm. if it's a meteor shower, you will see the ones that are that small. Mm -hmm. Like I say, the golf ball sized ones are the ones that are so bright you can see them in the day. So even the really small ones, you can you can usually the force see. that they're coming through that's making the light, is it refracting around it again? It's, it's, it's more just that it's, it's burning up as it goes through the atmosphere. Right. There's so much energy and just burning up, even though they're so small, the speed that they're going yeah. at makes it so you can see them. Yeah, so. it's affecting the atmosphere. So you need to... Oh, can you see it? Is that Venus then? I can't see it. Is it behind the tree, Sarah? No, it's, that, it's where I'm pointing. It's further left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's... Yeah, I see it. Yeah. I can see it, I can see it, I can see yeah. it. Yeah. I see oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a lot higher than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah no. Come on, it's there. Like, oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I really thought I can't see it. If you're ever thinking, how do I know if that's a star or if it's a planet, um, you have to do the twinkle test. Uh -huh. okay. Twinkle, twinkle, little star is, is a scientific song. Um, <laughs> Look at the swamp that come over to you now. <laughs> but yeah, stars twinkle because they are basically one ray of light that's getting refracted by the atmosphere. But planets are much closer and much bigger objects from what we can see at least. Um, and so they don't twinkle. So if you can look at it and it's not twinkling, and it's a planet, so that looks like a planet to me. That's Venus then. Stars, even planets though, as they get really close to the horizon, because it's so turbulent, can look like they're twinkling though, so it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's, it's a dubious, but usually if it's not twinkling, it's a planet, but that could... It's so cool that they just pop up, like... <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, I see it! <laughs> 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 that took me ages. <laughs> You're looking around. <laughs> The guy who's designing the stuff, the architect on the field, he's big into astrology. Astrology or astronomy? Astronomy. I don't know, looking at the stars. Astronomy. Basically. Astronomy. <laughs> so it's part of our proposals that we're putting through and that the planning commission is to put a little observatory on it. Oh, so that it wow, that'd be fantastic. Two or three people. So he was going to talk to the university, so it's probably you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, no. Mm. I love an observatory. One, I, there's an observatory that uh, that that I, I like called uh, in in Galloway in Scotland that got burnt down about two weeks ago. Oh, no. Wow, which is sad. <laughs> in a suspicious fire. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. What does it think happened? I don't know, but it's quite literally in the middle of nowhere. 
Um, it's in a dark sky park. There are some places in the UK that are designated dark sky parks, so you can't build anything on them that, that gives off any light so that you get those dark skies. And Galloway Forest Park was the first one in the UK. It's near the border of, of Scotland. Um, and yeah, they built an observatory in 2012, but it, but it is no more, unfortunately, as of a couple of weeks ago. It's um, not the Kielder one. Which one? The Kielder Observatory. Oh, I not that one. don't think so. I think it's just called Galloway okay. Observatory. Or at least it was, <laughs> I think. I hadn't actually been. I was hoping to go, but... No, I, I, I'm, I'm going to Kielder in uh, November, hopefully. Um, and I'm going to Galloway Forest Park in October. Yeah. Because I don't want to get lost. Are you going to show up and it's not going to be there? <laughs> that's in, uh, I think that's in Northumberland, I think, that one. Right. I think. We'll build one on the field for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask why we can't see the moon? Slight problem with light pollution. I think <laughs> that the moon, I think it's... Uh, well, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I would love to... I think it's behind the clouds, oh, but I'm not entirely sure. Light. So the moon is... Yeah, it's, it's kind of between where the sun would be and where Venus yeah, would be right now. Um, so I think it's probably behind the clouds. Oh. Either that or, or it's still too bright behind there that we can't see it. It's very low in the sky. Yeah, it's, it's reasonably... I mean, the moon also follows the line of the ecliptic as well, so it can be quite close to the sun. Um, because all of the, the moon and the planets, they lie in one plane, like, like kind of like a frisbee. So it can be quite close to the sun. Um, but I think it's behind the clouds or it's, it's too bright, but it is in that kind of area, just there at the minute. I mean, I thought that Venus was a bit lower, but apparently not, because we can see it, which is oh, great. I was hoping we could see it. I think we have time for one more question for Natalie, if anyone has anything they want to ask. It's not a final question. Is there anything we should know? <laughs> anything you should know? Oh, gosh. Oh, my God, I'm trying to think. In fun fact, <laughs> a fun fact. <laughs> I've got a lot of space fun facts, and <laughs> I am trying to whittle them down. <laughs> here's here's a fun fact. I think it's fun. I'm sorry. If it's not. Um, uh, the sun has what we call sunspots on it, and um, if you've ever seen a sunspot, they're just black bits on the sun, and those are cooler parts of the sun and they change on an 11-year cycle. Every 11 years, they start at the top, and then they get more and more towards the centre. And this, this happens every 11 years. And we've been tracking the cycle by looking at it for a long time, but we've been able to track it back even further by looking at the rings of trees, because you can track in the rings of trees the change of light just due to these sunspots every 11 years. That's a very fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a fun fact. <laughs> I think it's fun. <laughs> well done. Thank well done. you. <laughs>